69, if you would all check your devices, we would certainly appreciate that. Good morning, it is 9 a.m. Welcome to the July 3rd, 2018 City Council meeting on a Tuesday. Thank you for coming out and remembering that we were gonna be here today. Please, all city uh, council members and officials are present. Please stand for first an invocation, then the Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, as we approach this celebration of Independence Day, we thank you for the privilege of living in a country where we enjoy the many freedoms provided by our founding fathers in their wisdom, the freedom to assemble and to speak our minds without fear of retribution. Thou who art the perfection of love, harmony, and beauty, the Lord of heaven and earth, open our hearts that we may hear thy voice, which constantly comes from within. Disclose to us thy divine light hidden in our souls that we may know and understand life better. Most merciful and compassionate God, share with us thy great goodness, teach us thy living forgiveness. Raise us above the distinctions of differences which divide us. Send us the peace of thy divine spirit and unite us in all thy perfect being. All those things, amen. amen. I pray. John. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, today we have no proclamations and presentations. That's kind of unique. Uh, so now would be the time if your name is in the running for a board or committee position and you would like to introduce yourself, now would be the time. Please take the podium here, state your name, and tell us a little about, your, about yourself and what board or committee you're my name is Roger Predeson, and I'm presently a member of the Planning Commission. My term is about to expire. I've been here before, but uh, I enjoyed my four months that I've learned a lot, still learning a lot. I'm just asking for your consideration to reappoint me for another term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here uh, like to introduce themselves for a board or committee? Okay, seeing none, then we are going to recess as the City Council and shortly reconvene as the Community Redevelopment Agency. I'm sorry. Good morning. <laughs> Okay, like to call the CRA meeting to order. Let the record reflect that all commissioners are present. Um, first, on the CRA agenda, we have uh, citizens' comments on CRA agenda items only, which would be the project status report, the approval of the minutes, those two items. If anybody would like to speak on those two items, now would be the time. Okay, seeing nobody rising, we'll move into the project status report. Our Tunic CRA director. Monthly marina activity, pretty consistent with the previous months. Pump out vessel, more gallons pumped than a year ago, less miles traveled, not many non-Florida vessels. The uh, contractor, we're waiting on a, uh, setting up a pre-construction meeting because the purchase order has been issued. So we hope to get that construction started very, very soon once the contractor gets all of their insurance requirements and everything else. 
We have it now? Okay. So now we're waiting for the pre-construction meeting. They have a tight time frame. We thought we had a, uh, an agreement that we could execute between the principals of the Dream Salon. They have a, the Farler, Far Law Firm as their attorney, attorneys. Uh, we don't. So uh, our city attorney is looking in to um, how we're going to, the, what legally proceedings we have to do to, to terminate it. But the Panagorda coffee and tea, which is basically an extension of the uh, chocolate and wine shop, will open in the former foot landing place, September 1st. <coughs> That's their goal anyways. Fresh Market is, uh, we're finishing up drainage work. Uh, we'll meet with the uh, group that's gonna manage it, discuss remaining site cleanup, and when to open it up. We do have a backup group if they, if they can't, if they don't follow through. We do have a backup group for that. 90% plans before the end of July. And so they're moving along for the phase two. This one is not moving along. <laughs> um, the contractor showed up, did the repairs, and um, they were less than sterling repairs. <laughs> I was gonna use a different term, but I can't use it publicly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we don't, what do they do back? You what? Oh, go ahead. For the record, Joan LeBeau, Urban Design Manager. Uh, staff met with, on site with the contractor, the installer, and they're getting together a game plan. We have asked that they repair the entire um, areas that are damaged with no seams, which is one of the requirements we had when we made the contract, and we're waiting to hear back from them how they're gonna proceed. Yes? Do you know what is wrong, that the ground keeps dropping out from underneath? Uh, I do not know, and they were not, they had several ideas, but they're saying it's the water, we're saying it's, we've never had sink, prob sink problems before, so, I mean, I was the one that reported it originally because a friend of mine had his little two-year-old boy there and he fell and right. that concerned me greatly, but maybe we shouldn't have the park open, uh, the, the playground open while this is going on. They have um, kind of op um, cordoned <coughs> off the areas that have the, the dips in it, so we can look into that. I'll talk to Rick after the meeting and... I mean, it'd be a shame to close the whole entire park, but there are some areas that have no no problems. So, okay. so is this this picture in the middle is the repair that they did? That was one of them. Mm. That was the one near the the ship, and it's underneath where they come down the the slide. Like I said, it's less than sterling. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I, um. We're not ready to close the whole park yet. That's like closing the dog park. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but it's also a safety issue, so. Good analogy. Uh, the restrooms, um, pre-con meeting was held with the contractor, so they're gonna start soon. Yeah, yeah, that, that one's gonna proceed very soon. And, uh, 90% plans for the other restrooms by the pavilions have been received, we're reviewing them, so that's moving along too. Library well underway. Yep. There's even more progress than that photo. Mm -hmm. That's all we got. Questions for Howard? No. None. <clears throat> Okay, the next item of business is approval of the minutes of June 6, 2018. Who's next? Make a motion to approve minutes of uh, June the 6th, 2018. Is it, um, Second. 
We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carried unanimously. Yeah. Citizens' comments, no. CRA. Anybody like to speak on CRA? Now would be the time. Please take the podium to my right. State your name. You have three minutes. Anybody want to speak on CRA, anything in the CRA? Okay, seeing none, we will take commissioner comments. We'll start with Gary. I want to apologize to Jaha Cummings for not wearing a Hawaiian shirt today <laughs> so that we could have a little fun with Charlotte. Uh, it was my idea, and unfortunately, I got sidetracked and I forgot. But uh, uh, as usual, uh, Jaha came through. So. <laughs> Enjoy the break, everyone, and, and see you in August. <laughs> oh, we have, we have July 11th. Yes, but not CRA. Oh, yes, CRA, not CRA, yeah. CRA yeah. True. Yes. Good. I uh, wish everybody a happy uh, birthday. Uh, just note that tomorrow there's a full day of fun, excitement, and uh, fireworks uh, at Lashley Park. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, particularly, I'd like to uh, thank the business community that uh, supports this and gives uh, back so much to this city. Well said. Ditto. Jane? I just wish everybody a happy and safe Fourth of July. Nothing further. Just everyone happy Fourth. Yes, so you guys are on your break. Well, one question for John. Yeah. Do uh, you have a tie to go along with that? <laughs> I should get one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, we are adjourned. It's not knit. No. <laughs> no, no crochet ties. No. Okay, we are back in session as the City Council, and we do not have any public hearings or quasi judicial public hearings this morning, but we do have. One, two, three, second readings. Um, ZA02-18, ZA07-18, and PD01-18. If you would like to speak on those, one of those three items now would be the time. Please come to the podium to my right if you would like to speak on Z02-18, Z07-18, and PD01-18. Please take the podium to my right to speak on these items. They are not public hearings, but this is citizens' comments on these second readings, if anybody would like to speak. Okay, seeing none, we will move into Z02-18. Yes, and this is the second reading of an ordinance, which I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, rezoning 0 .90 plus or minus acres generally described as units one through 12 of Isles Colony condominium apartments, number Roman numeral two. A condominium according to the declaration of condominium required, recorded in OR book 182, page 418, and all exhibits and amendments thereof, public records of Charlotte County, Florida, from general multifamily 15 units per acre to neighborhood center, providing for conflict and severability and providing an effective date. Any questions, comments, changes, motions? Motion for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve Z02-18. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. Next, we have ZA07-18. This is the second reading of an ordinance, which will be title only, an ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending Chapter 26, Land Development Regulations, Punta Gorda Code, Article 3, Regulating District, Section 3.10, HC Highway Commercial District, Subsection F, to allow permanent canopy shade structures as a use permitted by special exception, and amending Section 4.39 to provide for conditions and specifications relating to permanent canopy shade structures, providing for conflict and severability and providing effective date. Any comments, questions, changes? Issues, motions. Move approval of ZA-07-18. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ZA-07-18. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Carried unanimously. And next we have PD-01-18. And this is a second reading of an ordinance, which I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, rezoning 4.02 plus or minus acres, 
generally described as 900 West Marion Avenue, Punta Gorda, Florida, and more particularly described as all of Block 13, City of Punta Gorda, according to the map or plat thereof as recorded in Plat Book 1, page 1 and 23, Public Records of Charlotte County, Florida, from its current zoning classification of neighborhood residential, 15 units per acre, to planned development neighborhood, providing for conflict and severability and providing an effective date. Questions, comments, changes? Move approval of PD 0118. Second. <coughs> second. We have a motion and <coughs> a second to approve PD 01-18. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. <coughs> and next we have the consent agenda, which includes one, two, three, four, five items. Approval of the minutes, the monthly litigation report, uh, Upland Software Maintenance and Support Contract, a resolution with uh, the federal FEMA to get reimbursements, and the Utilities Department has a resolution uh, supporting the Peace River Water Authority. I'd like to ask to please pull C1. C1, which is the Upland software contract? Yes. Okay. Anybody else have anything they want to pull? Mm -mm. Citizens' comments on consent agenda. Would anybody like to speak on any of the items on the consent agenda? Now would be the time. Okay, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda without C1. I so move. We need a second. second. <laughs> Gary moved and Lynn seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. And then we'll hear C1. Um, I just wanted to bring up the fact that uh, there was a discrepancy on this um, cover sheet about this particular agenda item. And it says funds estimated at annual expenditure of 50000 plus. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. And the contract originally was for $22,000. So I questioned why there was such a disparity on the numbers. And I had uh, Brad Schutte run some numbers for me yesterday. And there are actually two contracts that run um, contiguously with one another. And one of them was not actually <coughs> accounted for in the, in the document about the $22,000. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understands. We have the regular software contract. With, um, which is now owned by Upland Software. And um, that has increased since two, uh, 2016, it has increased $10,000. The original contract amount was somewhere around $24,000. It's now $34,500. And we also have a simultaneous contract with Empower for um, the cloud workflow that they use to allow people to access the website and um, access email and so forth. And that contract is, is basically a separate contract, and that costs $12,500 a year. So that is somewhere around the number that they're referring to with 50000 plus. But I'd, I would like to see something a little more accurate in the future, because I think that this was very misleading the way it was written in the documents for the package. So um, for calendar year 2019, we're looking at 34500 plus 12500 which is still $47,000, but it's less than 50,000 with a plus sign after it, which is um, very ambiguous and it could, it's just very misleading. I, I would like to see numbers that reflect more accurately what the real number is for these contracts because I think um, if we're approving all these budget items, we need to know exactly what we're dealing with. I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention that these are basically two separate contracts that work together with one <coughs> another, but even the total amount is less than what their anticipating expenditure is. And, and I don't like open-ended numbers where there's a plus sign after it either. I think that's, that's kind of misleading. So um, uh, with all that said, I mean, I, I think we should, um, we should approve an amended number if we're going to approve a contract based on what was told to me yesterday. Okay. Um, so it comes out to $47,000 for calendar year 19. Um, and I would be, I'm more comfortable with, uh, with approving an exact number if that's what we're really going to spend rather than 50,000 with an open-ended plus sign at the end of it. And I would make a motion to that extent. For the record, Marion Pace, procurement manager. Uh, this process was a uh, blanket notice of intended decision to single source. When we initially went out for the uh, notice of intended decision, that was the estimated annual cost. 
So that was within um, Howard's purview to approve that amount for the award. While we're going through and we're renewing some of these contracts, it's like, well, wait a minute, we may go over the next threshold of $50,000 on a single um, source purchase that then requires the city council to approve. These prices will be um, going up and flexible throughout the term, any given fiscal year, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the services that we're acquiring. So basically what this was to do was to get council's approval to continue the blanket notice of intended decision so we're within our procurement policy requirements for the appropriate level of award authority. Um, I, I'm very concerned with some of the budget numbers we're looking at right now, and, and this was one of those. I just thought that it was misrepresented in the, in the agenda package, and I, and I wanted to make sure everybody else understood what I, what I was told yesterday, because um, we're still looking at fiscal year 2019 at $47,000. So are we going to be doing this every year, or what kind of period of time are we, are we agreeing to? With the Upland Softland, uh, software, it is an embedded technology that the city uses. So basically, this is going to cover us. Um, we were trying to be proactive to obtain the next level of authority just in case in fiscal year 19. It goes <laughs> above Howard's authority. That was the intent of the agenda item. Okay. So basically, if we don't approve it as is, then if we did change it and only approve the dollar amount, it would not meet what you need it, you need to. You know, basically it would be, you know, it, it's just to, for future years so that we're, we have the correct award authority approving these purchases for the embedded technology. You, we don't know, I, I don't have any information as far as what next year's costs are gonna be. So like I said, we were just trying to be proactive, catch it so <laughs> that we can issue a PO um, without having to rush it back to council. Mayor, I mean, if you yes. want, if you want, we'll just bring it back to you again, but it's up to you. I, I guess I, I, I take Glenn's uh, points very poignantly. I also see the reason that you would want the flexibility. I would say, I think that if there was clarity in the way it was expressed and the need for the flexibility, that also there should be a cap on what that flexibility should be before it comes back to us. At 50,000 plus, I don't want to have a hundred thousand right. dollars at fifty thousand plus mm -hmm. right. sixty thousand dollars. I would consider. <coughs> you understand? You know, I'd want to see some cap where mm -hmm. you would understand. We would where you came to us and say, okay, we want a certain amount of flexibility because of the, all the good reasons that you just gave us. But I'd still want to see some cap on that flexibility so that we would still have final solution if it went uh, a little bit awry. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. I. I would agree, given um, what we're also d going to be discussing later with all of the, the various budgetary items, um, that there needs to be some constraint here because 50,000 plus is the sky's the limit. Yeah. It's very open-ended. And that's just like our Superion contract. Um, they're a single source. That's our HGL, our financial software, Navaline. Mm -hmm. um, we have the same um, type of notice of intended decision approved by city council because okay. it was going to be every year uh, 50,000, over 50,000 as well into like 100,000. So if you want to establish a cap, that's fine. And when we reach that cap, um, we would bring it back to you to notify you that we've reached the cap for that annual expenditure. Yeah, I'd refer to it as an ouch constant. At some point, we're going to say ouch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why don't you just approve 47,000 and if we go over it, we'll come back. That's, that's fine. We'll just come back. Or we could go the cap route, whatever you, would you say, 60, 60,000? 60, 60,000, like, you know. So at least 60,000 within, because this is embedded into the city's work. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like we can yeah. walk away. It's not something no, we can walk right. away. I wouldn't want to be in a situation <clears throat> where it interfered with the processes. Yeah, I agree. Especially so. when we do more online now than we ever have before. We exactly. have to be yes. cognizant of that, and that does take some funding. So if you're comfortable with 60, I think that would be appropriate. Can I just amend my motion? Uh, we can let that motion die. It was never seconded. Do you want to start over? Okay. Um, I will make a motion that we approve up to $60,000 expenditure, and at which point it must come back to City Council for review again. I second. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay. That takes care of the consent agenda.
And next we're moving into the regular agenda. So now would be the time for citizens comments on anything that's remaining in the meeting today. Uh, the appropriation of the additional funds for the meter, meter project, the award to uh, CEDRA for GIS study and design, fiscal year 2019 general fund budget update, employee classification pay plan study, a resolution, the, the, all the canal maintenance <coughs> districts and the lot mowing districts. So P BSI canal maintenance assessment district, PGI canal maintenance assessment district, and the city of Punta Gorda lot mowing. All of those are the assessments for <coughs> 2019. Then we have the, the scope of work for the citywide master plan, RFP, RFQ actually. And then we have uh, the Fisherman's Village litigation update. So now would be the time for anyone to speak on any one of those items. Please, you can take that podium there, sir. Uh, state your name, please, and that you have you have three minutes. Okay, my name is Jonathan Miller. Can you pull the mic up? I can. Yes, thank my you. My name is Jonathan Miller. I've lived here for 10 years. I have an association with Punta Gorda going back 25 years. Um, I have a grave concern that um, with the Sunseeker development happening across the bridge and with the restrictions that we continue to put on people investing capital into Punta Gorda, that our town centre is going to end up being over the bridge because we are putting restrictions in the pace of private commercial investment, which I don't understand. I understand that a redevelopment master plan, I'm an urban estate manager, just so you know, I have the highest level of property qualification in the world, I'm a charter surveyor, I'm a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and in the time that we're going to take to develop a master plan, our master plan will happen over the bridge. Um, the basis of <coughs> capitalism, and I believe that both, both political sides understand that you need private investment for anything to happen because the city can't do it. If we're putting restrictions on capital investment, we're stopping our town centre from recovering. It's been 15 years since Hurricane Charlie took away the little bit we had. And if we take our time developing what we're calling a master plan, it's going to happen over the bridge now. And it's going to be too late. And we keep, and forgive me for saying this, I'm going to upset a lot of people, it seems very hypocritical to me that we don't allow certain people into Punta Gorda, but we are developing Jones Loop and annexing each project as it comes ahead to get tax revenue. That is not a comprehensive understanding of how real estate works. It's the city cherry picking to increase revenue where it needs it. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude and I don't mean to upset anybody. But if we wait and we develop a master plan, master plans are about redevelopment. They're about zoning areas that don't work. They're about areas that are falling into disrepair because they're no <coughs> longer needed. They're not about arguing whether or not we need a 50 story or a 100 story building. That is what the market determines and that should be looked at on a case by case <coughs> basis. We've got a hotel that doesn't work properly being built already because there are rooms on the ground floor in the hotel industry, and I've worked for the largest hotelier in the UK, that is an unsustainable and unsafe operation that we've allowed to happen. The people in those rooms are at risk of being attacked in their rooms. Punta Gorda's very safe, it won't happen here. I believe that what we should be doing is allowing the people who want to invest into Punta Gorda to come in and to put forward their development suggestions and they should be considered on the commercial merit. <coughs> if we don't have the tax base, we won't have the community. There's not a single millennial in this room and there should be because they should be having jobs here, they should want to live here, they don't. They're going to leave because we're not getting ready for them. <coughs> Sorry, I don't mean to sound patronizing, but <coughs> this is something that I've been watching for a very long time, and I'm seeing a lot of people trying to protect our community in what they believe is the right way, but in the long term, they're going to damage it. If Sunseeker goes ahead, our town center will be over the bridge, and we won't recover from that. Thank you. My pleasure. Anybody else? Take the podium. Regular <coughs> agenda items. Now is the time to speak on anything that's left on the agenda. Anybody else? These are not public hearings. There will be council discussions. So if anybody else has anything else to add, please take the podium. Okay, seeing none, we will move into the first item under the budget, which is the appropriation of additional funds for automated meter infrastructure project. As they're getting up, uh, 
This is uh, additional funding that uh, was left out of the original purchase order for the retrofits. If you want to explain it a little more, go ahead. Good morning, Mary Pace, procurement manager for the record. Uh, when we were evaluating the final, um, best and final offers um, and trying to decipher what each little component was, we, we did go back to them and um, with uh, Fort Align Zenner and sent them a letter saying, okay, this is the total price to cover everything. And they said, yes, it was. Um, and we also, they also signed the agreement. However, there was one little portion that, uh, um, which was that the, there was two parts. There was the MIU and then like the repeater that would go on to the retrofit um, units, the zeners that we were retrofitting. Well, one portion of it was in another category and they didn't realize that when they were signing that, that that was left out of the best and final or the, uh, the contract price but it was included in the best and final when we selected them as the lowest bidder. So they requested us to increase the, um, the PO to include that missing component. And they're still the low bidder. Yes. So these things were needed all along. They just got left out on the final. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was, as far as trying to interpret what all their parts were, right. um, we tried every way we could to make sure that we identified everything correctly and they said, yes, we did, but they now go back and they look at it and we, that um, part was missing off of the purchase order. But nothing has changed with the project. We needed the parts in the beginning and now? Yes. Okay. And, yes. and that, was, that was represented in the best and final offer. It's just it was a different number came out on the PO, so we need those to match Got going it. forward. Nancy. So who left it off? Did they leave it off and they acknowledge that it was their error? Because if I'm a vendor and I screwed up, now I'm going to go back and ask for more money. Are we obligated to pay them more money? The part is required to be able to complete the retrofit. I, I get that. Yes. But are we obligated to pay for it since they signed the, the document? <clears throat> Just a question. I agree with you, ma'am. Um, you know, we take some responsibility too. Okay. So it's not all on the vendor. Right. We have to share in the responsibility. They are still the low bidder by almost $500,000. So let's not put it all on the vendor. Any other questions, comments, Lynn? I, I have to agree with Nancy's comment. Um, this is not a, a simple error of three or four thousand dollars. This is four hundred thousand dollars. Was this amount in their bid to the city? Yes. 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 It's when it was reduced to a purchase order, that column was not totaled in with the others. Yes. It was in their bid. Right. Yes. So the purchase order number did not agree with the bid number. That's correct. That's where the error occurred was in that transition from an actual bid to an actual Yes, when we were trying to identify the actual components, now that we were going to be retrofitting the Zeners, because they, they were the only one who um, submitted a proposal for retrofitting, and trying to go through and clarify all those items, it wasn't caught through there that, you know, they say, no, you need to put that, add that item back in, because how we had the list, it was like, okay, if you're going to retrofit, then this gets deducted and everything like that, and they should have said in the beginning, no, that does not get de deducted. And, and even with this additional money, they're still yes, a low sir. bidder by about a half a million dollars. Yes. Yep, 480000 So basically this was a mutual <laughs> error issue that didn't affect the final outcome of the bid. Correct. So do we have a motion? Motion for approval. <clears throat> Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? I said aye. Okay. Carried unanimously. Thank you. I just had to ask the question. I think it's a legitimate yeah. question. Oh, it's definitely I think, legitimate. I think we need, really need to understand, understand mm -hmm. it. Because mm -hmm. uh, residents have been asking me. Yes. Oh, cool. And so yeah. I'm, I'm expressing to you what I'm getting in, in mm -hmm. feedback from residents. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And I'm gathering this was an honest mistake that if we don't correct then the, the vendor is not going to be able to complete the project properly because he's just not going to be able to have the revenue to right. get the parts. So we really right. need to 
to, to work with them on that respect, and we're still getting good value for what we were asking. And this is not coming out of general fund. This is coming out of the revenue funds from the Water Department. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Okay. At the same time, we need to be cognizant of the fact that there was a serious error made on this. Yes. And can't allow this kind of stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. We are human beings. I know. Between I the it. vendor and our staff, <laughs> we messed up. Yeah. But it was part of the original bid. Okay, next we have award agreement and specific authorization number one for a GIS study and design for the utilities department to the Cedric Corporation of Victor, New York. Yeah, we want to get moving on this. This is one of our priorities is to get all of the utilities, water lines, sewer lines, you name it, into our GIS system now that we have a GIS person on board. So uh, they're going to help utilities out immensely and our new GIS. Yes. Um, question about how this co uh, company would interact with our new GIS person on the IT staff. Because uh, I was looking at this and going, okay. Is uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to holler for Brad's help to come in, but their main function is to lay out a framework or a blueprint for how we map and transition from our paper maps into electronic mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to tell us the best and most efficient and cost-effective way to do that because we have drawers and drawers and drawers over 100 years worth of paper maps that say the water line is here, the sewer line is here, the valve is here. Mm -hmm. How do we digitalize those the best way, the most effective way? If you talk to nine GIS people, they'll give you nine different ways to do that. We need a firm that specializes in that to give us a blueprint going forward. And Brad, if I've said anything incorrectly, please help me out with that. We've already met with uh, uh, IT's GIS mm -hmm. uh, uh, specialist. He is plugged into this project. He will be attending the meetings going forward. So that's the first step. Okay. And then they will also help us with uh, how we move forward and a framework for how we collect it, new information from projects that are turned over to the city or projects that we develop, how those are digitized and standardized to fit with our GIS system that Brad's staff is building. Okay. And just to clarify, it was very competitive. There were seven responders, mm -hmm. so. Well, I just wanted to understand how, the, how it all interrelated. Right. So that Because, right. you know, residents are looking at this and saying, well, gee, if we have a GIS person, then why isn't the GIS person doing this? And it's obvious there has to be a reason why where we are hiring uh, this expertise. The, the secondary reason is we have enough work for three of Brad's GIS people. So if we tried to task him to accomplish all this, he wouldn't accomplish anything else for the city. So we need to catch up to where they already are. And I understand from um, work with the Burnstar Isles Underground Project that we didn't have information um, that even uh, Florida Power and Light wanted. And so we were behind the, the curve on that as well as capturing um, you know, we, we, we heard Johnny Lloyd, you know, uh, it's all up here, so we've got to capture that, It's all too. Johnny Lloyd's fault when he left <laughs> it created. <laughs> it's all in Rick Keeney's yes. head as well. Thank <laughs> you for the explanation. Right. Gary. I just want to say uh, just a couple quick comments. Tom and I have had this conversation since the very first day that he gave me a tour at the water plant, and, uh, and this is something that in my, my uh, uh, career have been very much involved with customers for the years as plants got older. Only one person remember where a valve was. Uh, I have two questions, one comment and then one quick question. One comment is, regarding to why we do need this, is we have about 20% less staff than we had in about uh, 2006. Mm -hmm. So the good news is, is that our staff doesn't have a lot of fat in it. It's just got really good meat in it. This is a project that needs some extra meat for, to get the project done, and it's going to have a positive ROI over the years. I assume that in this project, we're also not only going to be mapping these 100-year-old pieces of paper, but also updating what's really still there and what has been abandoned and so forth. Absolutely. Going forward, a big uh, effort on our part uh, after we get this blueprint developed will be ground truthing uh, because just because we have a, a paper map that says a valve is here or a line is here, we need to verify that before we put it into the system. Right. We, we, we find the best efforts uh, to, to measure and get these things accurate, this will verify and correct that. Yes. Okay. So that's where the ROI is going to come is down the, in the future as uh, we uh, have to uh, 
replace infrastructure and also add new infrastructure, et cetera. We don't have to go chase our tail to find out where we need to go. Mm -hmm. We're going to already have the roadmap and where we want to add the next intersection, so to speak. So yes. I, it's a very good, good and important project. So do we have a motion? I so move. Second. Second. You know, to share one thing also, sure. I, 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 I met with um, a drone company based at Babcock Ranch yesterday, and they're willing to, to give you a free demo in terms of doing, let's say, 50 acres of map of mapping and or marketing videos, whatever, but basically I want to introduce them to you because they can maybe help when you're doing the GIS to be able to do that, and they, they offer that, especially construction services, utilities, things like that. So I'll introduce you to them and see where that goes. Very good. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay, next we have the fiscal year 2019 general fund budget update. Good morning, Kristen Simeone, interim finance director. We are gonna give you an update since the uh, May 16th meeting of where we're at for the general fund. So some of the approved changes that happened on 516 were, and since then, were the SRO contract to increase the revenue $260,000, and the approved positions that were um, made at that particular time were for the dispatcher, community engagement officers, and again, that one was only a quarter of a year, not the full year, an EMS training chief, a computer support specialist, and we only put the general fund share in this particular slide, and then the school resource program. And I just want to point out the um, the program is 311-120. The contract with the school board was for 260, and that was because the sheriffs off um, were going to we're able to do it a little bit less in the city, and so we said we would match that. So there is a few things, and in that number, some of those a little bit of that is um, the first year expenses that won't carry over to the following year. Um, so the increase in use of reserves for fiscal year 19 from these decisions are $293,120. Um, so again, um, this is just a recap of the SROs, and we want to point out that um, currently the new SROs will use um, vehicles that would have been auctioned, they're older vehicles, so that's a short-term solution at this time. The school board will not contribute funding towards the vehicles, so we will have to look at that um, in, the, in the future budget year of how we're gonna fund those vehicles mm -hmm. through either general fund capital outlay or 1% sales tax. Um, this slide just shows you where we were at on 516. Um, as well as then the approved changes. And then in the meantime, we've also uh, looked at the revenues again as things have been coming in and adjusted some revenues. So our current use of operating reserves are $733,480 for this current budget. We've always looked ahead um, because we are still using reserves for operating. And so we do wanna show you the based on those decisions made where we're at for fiscal year 2020. Um, so right now there is still currently a gap of 798,000 for fiscal year 20. Um, we wanted to bring you, again, based on all those decisions, where we are with the estimated ending reserves available. This is after the minimum required balance. So we were at one million, about a million and a half for reserves. There are some additional council actions that affect those available reserves that are in fiscal year 18, and that was the 412 Allen Street tax payments and demolition. We do hope to receive some revenue if we can sell that property. And then the first quarter of the three additional SROs, and again, that's a timing difference, but of course the timing difference doesn't really end till the program ends. So with those two changes, our revised estimated ending reserves are 1,445,000 approximately. Some items not currently in the proposed fiscal year 19 budget, but um, with recent information we have, we will have to include some of these items and others are still up for discussion. But we did get the seven, July 1st appraiser's estimated tax value. 
um, and that effect is approximately an additional $150,000 in revenue. With that, the CRA taxable, taxable value also increased slightly, so that increases our transfer that is required to the CRA by $19,400. We do have a new actuary requirement, or I should say a, a GASB requirement um, for the other post-employment benefits. It'll be similar to the pension plan, and we have to, the actuaries have to do the calculations that'll be put into our annual financials. So we're estimating approximately $15,000 needed for that project. Is that every year ongoing? It will be ongoing. I think we can do it every two years, but I'll have to double check the requirement. Okay. Our health insurance, um, we did get, we originally had an estimate of 6%. We did get our rates and we're at 8%. So that effect for the general fund is $39,930 increase. We did have a slight life insurance decrease. So that's um, reflected there, approximately 5,000 for the general fund. We did get some bids back for the sec building security systems. So those estimates are approximately 110,000 for the general fund. Um, it's a higher amount, but this is the portion that we would allocate to the general fund. Other funds will also be taking a share for the building securities. We have a classification and compensation recommended implementation. This excludes the non-bargaining and excluding public safety command staff. Um, that effect would be approximately 49,000 for the general fund. And again, um, finance would rec recommend use of reserves with system balancing fiscal year 2020 of 798,000. Other items, oh yes. On the previous slide, <laughs> so your, your title of the slide says proposed FY 2019, mm -hmm. but at the bottom, you have use of reserves to assist in balancing 2020. So right. aren't we mis mixing apples and oranges here? I mean, this is you know a, a future year, not the current budget we're speaking about. Right, when we have um, provided information in the past, we've always looked ahead a year, and council has sometimes, in many cases, made the decision to set those funds aside, knowing there's a future problem. So if it were, part of this process, it does affect the amount of available balance you would have for fiscal year 19. We've updated another slide for you. Yes. Okay, because every year I've, that I've been on council, we always start the budget process with a gap. Mm -hmm. And we always narrow the gap or we work through it. And um, to me, uh, I, and I've been in you know business planning uh, for a long time, and this just muddies the waters. It just, it, you know, we're talking 2019. I, I get what you're saying, mm -hmm. but that should be shown separately. Okay. We will show it on another slide as well. Okay. Other items still not included in any year of the, the budget is um, City Hall Annex renovations, which could be up to 273000 based on proposals that came in. Public safety bargaining units and command staff pay plan is pending as we're going through um, contract negotiations. Citywide master plan is still to, to be determined. IT unfunded project needs, still unknown at this time. Pending legislation for increased homestead exemption for fiscal year 2020. Um, again, looking ahead, there would be possibly reduced ad valorem revenue in a future year. Um, the three patrol vehicles for SROs, Again, funding to be determined approximately 135,000. And two patrol vehicles for the community engagement unit would be approximately 90,000. And again, that would probably be in a future year as they will continue to use older vehicles that would have been auctioned. Um, this particular slide is again showing the items that we think um, would move forward at this time. Again, it's still based on discussion, but um, <coughs> so this number can change. Um, so that would be the assumed, reser uh, assumed ending reserve if these particular items were approved. Here is the additional slide um, that we were talking about that just shows fiscal year 19 impacts that could happen. Just wanna Stay on that slide for a minute. Yes. 
So um, we already have the 8% reserve set aside. The 1,445 is over and above yes. the 8% reserve. Mm -hmm. And um, this list here is what we have identified that we plan to deal with some way or another as part of the FY 2019 budget. So we have dollars for many of the items, but the ones we don't have yet uh, are the bargaining units and the command staff for public safety, the master plan, which we're going to be discussing later on, IT, um, you know, that, that fluctuates based on priorities. We, we mm -hmm. may not have to do anything additional this year. City Hall annex renovations, the refresh, we've been talking about that a long time. We may be able to limit what we do next fiscal year. Some of these items, if they're one-time costs, such as the master plan, which is a one-time cost. Actually, City Hall renovations is a one-time cost. <coughs> Building security systems, one-time cost. We always had in the back of our mind a funding source for that, that um, our city attorney is going to bring up later in the agenda. If not, you can have him bring it up right now. And that's the Fisherman's Village uh, sale money of $3.5 which sits in our bank account that we just can't use yet. I mean, we could use it, but it's... We've recommended not to until we settle the uh, agreement. That impacts uh, funding sources for some of these items. Mm -hmm. Do you want to give us an update while we're here? I mean, I don't, unless you want to wait. You asking me? Mm -hmm. no, who can, who can I'm, I'm good with that. Let's yeah, talk. Let's, yeah, let's, let's hear it. Let's well, hear it. I'm, I'm, I had recent conversations with the attorney representing the heirs of, uh, of, of the View family, and I'm cautiously optimistic that if not by the next city council meeting, certainly by the city council meeting in August, that we'll have a settlement proposal that approved by heirs of the View Wood, uh, the View. So. Um, that's what we've been waiting on, is getting signatures on their proposal. So, again, um, I'm, again, very cautiously but mm -hmm. optimistic that we're going to be able to bring that litigation to a conclusion very soon. Is there a financial implication for the city in the negotiations that you're having right now? Well... Again, I, negotiations is not really the right word okay. where we've discussed proposals. And there, and there um, should be no uh, net uh, impact financially with respect to the city if all things work out the way that we've been discussing. Okay. Other than that, I think that, I mean, I'm trying to be as optimistic as I can and realistic. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this has been not, I won't say on the back burner, the difficulty or the reason why it's taken a while is my insistence that the agreement be signed off on by as many of the heirs as can, can be identified. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, attorney for the plaintiff in this case has been working diligently to try to make that happen. And I think we're close. Okay. Mm. You want me to take it back up or you want Christine to, do you have any more slides? Is yes. That, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Two more yeah. slides. Yeah. Um, so currently we want to let you know what's currently in the <coughs> proposed budget was the maintaining the millage rate of 3.1969. But, you know, looking at all the items that are still pending and everything like that, we just want to, um, let you know what the value of a 0.1 mills would generate. So that would generate approximately 298,000 and that's based on our July 1st taxable value estimate. And I'm sorry, I didn't update that slide. It should have said July 1. Um, I updated the number, but 
missed the June one there. Um, so basically on the current rate of the 3.1969 with, and again, I'm sorry, I kind of rushed to get these slides updated for the July one number that just had come in, um, is 9,528,000 with that valorum. And again, with an increase of a 0 0.1, meaning the millage rate would be 3.2969, that would generate 9,826,000. So there's the difference of the 298,000. So to frame the discussion we're going to have, on July 11th, you're gonna set a not to exceed millage rate. You do that every year, mm -hmm. not to exceed. We've been working on the uh, goal, the objective, uh, since the get-go to not increase the millage rate, to keep it the same again. And we're willing to do that. We are willing to do that. Um, you know, we don't know where the fisherman's village, we, we, he's cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to use some of those dollars for some of these one-time expenses. Um, and if we do keep the millage rate the same, even if depending where we go with that, While we have some positions that we've added to the budget tentatively, uh, by the time September rolls around, depending on how circumstances turn out, uh, we may be recommending that those positions not be added to the budget because mm -hmm. those are recurring budget, recurring positions, recurring costs, with the exception of the school resource officers. Right. They have to stay. And we will be willing to make that decision based on keeping the millage rate the same and trying to preserve uh, the reserves that we have. As far as the contracts with the police and fire, do we not have any assumptions that we put in the budget for those? Or The only assumptions we had put in, like we did for all employees, was a 3% merit increase okay. and the estimated increases for the health insurances. And, and so anything over that like is not budgeted. That's correct. And, and the reason we make that statement is rather than adding new positions, which, which are needed, I'm not saying they're not needed, we feel we need to um, deal and with the employees that are currently working in the best manner that we can, rather than putting money into new positions, if we're gonna keep that millage rate the same, which we are prepared to do. Comments, yes, Gary. Um, my comments aren't uh, to direct numbers, but rather philosophically, relative to the, um, the asset that we have for potential use to the, uh, for the Fishville sale. Uh, I feel strongly that any monies that come out of that should not be something that's used to kick an, a can down the road in some of our budget items. I certainly have no issue when it comes to adding security to a building or refurbishing a durable building. That has a durability, durable value uh, to the asset of the city. I just would want us to be cautioned to not uh, think in terms of that also bails out, as I've expressed previously, my concern of not meeting minimum standard for uh, uh, operating budget reserve. I would prefer to see us, since we are uh, an affluent uh, community, to see us much above standard in that regards. Uh, and I would hope that we would philosophically not think in the back of our heads that, that, uh, that those assets that we have from the Fishville sale would be used for that type of, type of expenditure. So I just wanted to state that as a matter of uh, record <coughs> and philosophy on my individual part. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I would like.